life more abundant with me. Always abounding and filled with my goodness, life overflowing, you'll see. I came so you can have life more abundant, life more abundant with me. Always abounding and filled with my goodness, life overflowing, you'll see. Spirit of the Lord is flowing through me, proclaiming the good news to all in me. Welcome to Z Church. This morning, Elder Bob will be teaching things we know that just ain't so. You're going to need paper and pen today, so grab them up. We will be having communion following the message, so be prepared. And you can give a prayer request in chat or in the comments. We will pray for you today. Then stay around for the afterglow. Terry is our host today, and you're going to have a great time. Will you pray for us, Pastor Sharon? Yes, thank you, Christine. Father God, we just love you so much. We thank you for your mercy and grace and for your great love for all of us. Thank you that we're one spirit with you. Open the eyes of our hearts and flood us with your light today. We thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. Thank you for what your spirit is speaking to your people, for the impartations from your word and your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. And Joseph, would you lead us in worship? We know Jesus was the lamb who was slain, substituted his life for us. Listen. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. Sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Flashes of lightning, rolls of 
Praise God. I love that song. It's a it's a beautiful song, and it's an anointed song. Wow, we had such a great service, uh, pre-prayer service before the service began, so I know this is going to be a great day. I'm Pastor Larry Huggins. This is Z Church, and the next voice you hear is going to be Pastor Loretta Huggins. Yes, that is right. <laughs> and I tell you, Pastor Larry, I too love that song. It's Great just song. so anointed and it's it's what our faith is based upon. Jesus, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. Praise God. And our uh, worship leader, Joseph, just he's so anointed. And as you said, the pre-prayer was just a blessing. Words of knowledge came forth and just the Lord has been blessing us with his presence. And we are in for a good time today. Our elder Bob will be ministering. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I think Bob's uh, pretty excited about it too. Um, uh, when he first got started, he didn't think he had much to say. And, and now he's found out he's got a lot to say. And it's good. So I'm very excited. Uh, Pastor Loretta, I'm going to ask you to pray for it all of our team before we get started here. Absolutely, it'd be my honor. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we come before you where the blood of Jesus Christ has been offered to you. The blood has been offered on behalf of our Amen. entire Z team. The blood has covered them, covered their lives, their families, and we speak the power of the anointing of the blood of Jesus. As my husband calls it, liquid love. We thank you for it. And we say, God, that your will, ha ha, your will be done. And I tell you, ha ha, glory to God. You know what, Z team, let's unmute ourselves and just give God glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Never God. What manner you. of love you. has the Hallelujah. Father bestowed upon us that we yeah. should be called, Z team, you are called the children of God, but you're not only called the children of God, you are. Amen. You absolutely are. Well, Father God, I thank you for the blessings over Z Church, and I think the anointing is just all over our apartment. Yeah, yeah that's right. I feel it. 
Well, listen, thank you, Pastor Loretta. And I'm going to I'm gonna shout out to all of our friends who are watching on YouTube Live and Facebook Live or any other program you may be using to watch and listen to the Z Church broadcast. We love you and we're here for you. And we, we are always thinking about you, about reaching out and touching someone who has a need, who needs a word. And uh, I want you to expect a blessing today. Expect a miracle. Be listening as Pastor Elder, uh, Pastor Elder Bob, I just promoted him, Elder Bob, uh, shares his message with us. And uh, if you have a prayer request and you want us to pray live, uh, put that in the chat or the comments and, and they will bounce, our, our uh, team will bounce that over to us and and Pastor Loretta and Terry will pray for you live on the air. So the next voice you're going to hear is our elder. And I have to tell you that Elder Bob was number one. He, uh, he and I did some uh, things together before Z Church started. And when the Lord put it in my heart to launch Z Church, I told Bob, I said, you got to help me. God's given me this uh, vision for launching Z Church. And he was uh, the very first team member. And he has really fulfilled the role of an elder. Everybody loves him. He's like a balance wheel here. Keeps us all steady and keeps us all happy. The next person you see in here is going to be Elder Bob. So unmute yourself, Z team, and let's thank God for our elder. Praise, Praise God. God. Praise, Praise God. God. Hallelujah. Ready. You thank Praise you, Lord. God. Hallelujah. I am honored and thank you, everyone. And thank you, Jesus. I'm honored to be to be called and promoted and used of him. It's only his doing, not mine. Um, it's only his anointing and calling and gifts that he gives to his church. Um, today's message is titled, Things We Know That Just Ain't So. I like it. And the subtitle is, and it's one of the things that we know that just ain't so, in the last days, everything will get worse and worse. Oh, my God. Yeah, how many times have you heard that? Um, it, it's one of the things I think Christians most believe more than anything else. It's the thing I hear repeated almost the most often. Uh, That's so. Oh, yeah, it's a sure sign of the last days when everybody starts to sin and everything gets corrupt. The days are dark and the devil is increasing and, and the Antichrist is about to come martyr and kill us all. And then Jesus returns. That, that, <laughs> that We think all that's got to happen in order for Jesus to return. And... Uh, and we pick up things like this unwittingly. I've, I've found in recent years, I've started to observe that um, there are things that we know that it turns out just ain't so. Yeah. Because instead of picking them up by the study of the word or listening to a, a called anointed teacher teach from the text of the word, and instead of praying and getting the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit to, to enlighten us to see and understand scripture by scripture, Instead, we, we have a habit of sometimes just assuming stuff. That's and true. other times we have a habit of just hearing people say stuff and assuming if they're saying it, it must be so. Yeah. Especially yeah. if they're like in our church or, or, or circle of influence, if they belong to the same political party or denomination, well, we just assume whatever people in that circle are saying, uh, it must be scripture. It must be settled doctrine. but. But we need to start questioning stuff. I actually preached a message on that a while back. We need to question everything yeah. that we think we know, because we don't necessarily know it. And I've also found out that the Bible says, seek and you will find. The finding is not just for everyone who sits there assuming you know it all. The, the finding is for those who get up and seek and, and question everything we think we know and ask the Lord, Lord, is it really so? Have I just heard this from others, or have you taught me from your word and your spirit? And we need to be seeking to understand these things. Yeah. Amen. And, this is and good so one. I found out, because I'm vulnerable to the same thing, it turns out. About 10 years ago or so, um, <clears throat> I was perusing Facebook one day and reading posts and read some post about, about some bad thing going on and everything's going downhill and bad. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll show how smart I am. I'll, I'll, I'll put a post back about, well, you know, it is the last days and everything is getting worse and worse. I thought I'd show my scripture knowledge. And I, I, I was going to quote scripture that I had memorized 
I had memorized this. And 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 just before writing it, though, I I, I heard the the ghost of of John Beale, our our brother who's gone on to heaven and was a mentor to me. And and John had a beautiful way of correcting people, not by confrontation or dictating to them. He had a really cool way of like asking questions and and to answer the honest, genuine, gentle question, you kind of had to back yourself into a corner and find out, oh, I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was a wise man. Yeah. Yeah. That that's really a really effective way to correct people, get them to correct themselves. And so Amen. I could kind of hear John in the back of my mind kind of prompting them. Um, Bob, wouldn't it be a good idea to actually look up the scripture and like quote it exactly, you know, to really prove your point? So I did. I I, I did a search for those words about in the last days, men will be lovers of pleasure and this and that and grow worse and worse. Come to find out it's not in the Bible. It doesn't exist. And I I did some more searching and I started to find parts of what I thought I had memorized as an actual scripture. And I started to find parts of it in, let me get my uh, notes up here, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 is where I had got this from. And indeed, 2 Timothy chapter 3 begins with, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And it goes on like that for two or three more verses. <clears throat> but then I, I, I look for that other part that talks about men, evil men growing worse and worse, which is another one of the signs of the last days, right? Um, I, I look for that. And that's all the way down in verse 13. That's seven verses in between this talk about the last days and the mention of, of all the evil things people will do. Seven verses in between there and the statement about, about evil men growing worse and worse. And I got to reading those seven verses in between and doing some study and, and reading in the commentaries and found out Paul launched into to talking to Timothy about false teachers. This, this whole chapter is not as much about last days it is, as it is Paul writing to Timothy about false teachers, purveyors of false religion, who will, who will persecute and come against the true faith and, and who will be coming to a town near Timothy soon. So be warned, beware, be ready. And, and Paul spends seven verses talking about false teachers uh, uh, he describes them as those who creep into houses and make captives because they they bring into captivity under under bondage to to the law again. Um, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's that's a prime description of of any cult. They're just always always learning, but it never brings them to the knowledge of the truth. Um, Paul goes on and and explains to Timothy, "Don't worry about it, though." Their progress, they, they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all. Uh, but you have carefully followed my doctrine and, and manner of faith and purpose, and including you followed my persecutions and afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. And I found that interesting. I looked up those places and found out those are all three places where Paul like he normally did, went into the synagogue and, and got confronted by the Jews and persecuted, stoned and beaten and run out of town. Paul is talking about the Jews and or the Judaizers who, I've got to say, are actually Paul's number one nemesis throughout the New Testament. I, I don't mean just, just people who are descendants of Abraham. I'm talking about the Jews that are the leaders of Judaism in the synagogue where Paul would go to preach the gospel and, and always end up being persecuted and run out of town by them. And, and the Judaizers who would come in among Christians and act like, well, you know, it's okay to have Christ, but, you know, you really do need to be circumcised too. Well, and then there's the feast days. Well, and then there's the dietary things. And they were always creeping in among Christians trying to bring the law back in and bring people back under, as That's Paul true. said, 
captivity, captivity to the law. And, and Paul was actually spending seven verses here warning Timothy about the, the Judaizers and persecutors, the, the purveyors of false religion and false teachers who would try to creep in. But he's telling them, don't worry about them. Just, just hold fast to the gospel that you've been taught, and God will deliver you out of the persecutions like he did me. And, and, and the folly of these false teachers will be evident if you just keep preaching the gospel that's been delivered to you. The, Very good. The false religion Praise. isn't going to overcome you and deceive you and take you away. And finally, after seven verses of talking about that, Paul says, but evil men and imposters, meaning the false teachers, will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That is a very good point, Elder. Yes. And that's got nothing to do with last days, end times, or, or the second coming. Paul is teaching about false teachers and the fact that they have, they have given themselves over to a deception. And those who do such, don't, don't bother just thinking you can have a nice theological debate with them and straighten them out. No, evil men and, and imposters like that, they only grow worse and worse because they're so devoted to their deception that, that they, just, they just increase and, and create more false doctrines and get more determined to deceive more people. But he's not talking about the general spiritual atmosphere of the planet growing worse. He's not talking about people in general. He's not talking about the days before the second coming. He's talking about false teachers right then, there, in that day that Timothy was, was going to have to deal with and that Paul himself had dealt with. Amen. Pretty good. Come on. <clears throat> that was an awakening for me to find yeah. out that, that, the, that, that, that the verse I had memorized, and I had heard all my life, it seems that I've been hearing Christian people say, well, that's a sign of the last days. Everybody's going to get worse and worse. It's completely taken out of context. This is starting to change my theology, and it's making me wonder, well, then what else do I have wrong? So after finding that out, I went back up to the top of that chapter where it says, but in the last days. And I thought, okay, last days. Now, now I, 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 everyone, I think, assumes like me, the last days are the last few days right before Jesus returns, right? Well, I wonder how many days. Well, three days is a few well, oh, seven is the perfect number. It's probably seven days, or, or maybe it's days of years. Maybe it's seven years. I wonder, when do the last days begin? So I thought, I, I, I got real smart and inspired, I think, by the Spirit to, to actually do a Bible search for the term last days. Maybe the Bible has some commentary about what the last days are, and maybe I can figure out when the last days begin. Well, the first scripture that I found that, that uses the term last days is in Acts 2, 16 through 17, where on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit fell, and the, and the people were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues. And the passerby is asked, what's going on? And Peter, prompted by the Holy Spirit, stood up and said, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on yes. all flesh. This is good preaching, yes. Bob. Yes. Wait a minute now. P Peter is explaining that the spirit is being poured out and that Joel told us that would happen in the last days. But how, how could the day of Pentecost be the last days when 2,000 years later, me and all the Christians I know know that the last days is something that's still coming ahead just before Jesus returns. But but Peter, Joel, and the Holy Ghost all seem to think that the last days started on the day of Pentecost. <laughs> Praise I, I, God. This is good. Yeah, yeah. How can this be? Th this is this is this is hard to swallow. But uh, well, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, it's supposed to be established, right? And and we got we got three witnesses right there, Peter, Joel, and the Holy Ghost. But but that isn't all. I, I looked at the next reference. The next place I found in the Bible where the term last days appears is in Hebrews chapter one, verses one and two. Now we understand Hebrews to be written by Paul. 
Paul, the guy who received the primary revelation of the whole new covenant. I mean, how much better authority can you get than an Old Testament prophet, Joel, Peter, the the the, the right hand guy throughout the the twelve disciples period there, and and now Paul, the guy who receives the revelation of the New Testament, he says God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. These, there you go. These, yeah, I, I told you I was going to refer to Pastor Loretta today, who, who's our uh, English grammar uh, person here. I, 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 I'm not strong <laughs> in English grammar, but I kind of think these is present tense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Come on. Paul is saying these last days. Now, now, how confused could could Paul be? Two thousand. In our mind, the last days haven't come yet. But two thousand years ago, Paul thought it was already the last days. What's going on? Yeah. Are the last days something different than what we think? Maybe it's us that need to be straightened out, not Peter, Paul, Joel, wow. and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> these last days. These last days, Paul says. So I did some more study. You go back to Acts chapter 2 there, where, where Peter said on the day of Pentecost uh, <clears throat> about the last days. And I read the commentary by Albert Barnes there. And, and um, there's like two long paragraphs of commentary, and you'd do well to go read all of it. But I, I gleaned just a few highlights for us here today that I'm going to read that I, I think really helps put this in perspective and helps us understand. Uh, regarding the phrase last days, Mr. Barnes says, it was a phrase in contrast with the days of the patriarchs, the kings, the prophets, etc. The last days, or the closing period of the world, were the days of Messiah. They anticipated a long and glorious time under the dominion of Messiah. The expression was understood by the writers of the New Testament as referring, undoubtedly, to the times of the gospel. And hence, they often used it as denoting that the time of the expected Messiah had come, but not to imply that the world was drawing near to an end. And we forget that, that, that these were uh, all Jews who wrote the, all the New Testament. They were all coming from a Jewish mindset, not, not to put a premium yeah, on Judaism, true. but they were all coming from a Jewish background and mindset and, <clears throat> and viewing things through that culture. And in that culture, they were understanding that there were many days, not necessarily meaning 24-hour periods, but days like we might refer to uh, the, the days of the horse and buggy versus the days of the automobile. That, that doesn't mean they, that the horse and buggy only lasted 24 hours. Yeah, we're, we're talking to an, ev an event period, a, a time, a dispensation, a period in, in history. In the Jewish mindset, they were understanding that since the fall of man in the garden, many days or dispensations or periods had passed, but that in their mind, in their worldview, all of these periods were looking forward to the great last day or last event period where the Messiah would come. Yes. That's the last days, the last event period that they're looking forward to and anticipating with great joy. And I can show you more places where the New Testament bears witness to this. Now that we understand the term last days to be more than just days, but, but rather an age, a time, an event, Consider 1 Peter 1.20, where it says, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times. There you go. The, the last of times or periods or dispensations. 1 John 2.18, John says, Little children, it is the last time. They understood that there were many times, and the last one would be the time of Messiah coming, and he's saying, this is it. Messiah has come. We're in that last and great and glorious day. Praise God. Hebrews 9.26 says, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once 
at the end of the ages, he has appeared. Yes. End of the ages? You're saying that when Jesus appeared was the end of the ages, but 2,000 years later, we're still looking forward to the end? No. In their mind, they're thinking of all the ages or dispensations that man had been through waiting and looking forward to the age or time of Messiah. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Not the end of the world. Not the end of the world, it's all over. They understood we have, the ages of, of old have ended, and the age we've been looking for of Messiah has come, and now we've entered this glorious time where Messiah and the this kingdom is, is available, and we're going to continue in this for a long time. That's the Bible view of last days, and I'm sorry, I've got to, I've got to correct us from using the term last days as meaning anything but the days of Messiah that began 2,000 years ago and will continue until he comes again. Praise, Praise God. God. Bob, this is good. We, yeah. We've been using some false terms, some non-biblical terms. As far as that goes, we even use the term end times. When we're not saying last days, we say end times. Frankly, I don't find that in the Bible either. The end of times or ages referred to in the Bible is the end of the Old Testament, Old Covenant ages, and the beginning of the new last age, last days of Messiah. We, we need to straighten out our Christian vocabulary and start, start to talk like the Bible. Yeah, I'm going to yes. become a last days person, meaning the last days began with the coming of Jesus, and now the kingdom is available, and we're going to live and walk in it. Hallelujah. Yeah. Come on. Amen. Amen. And and what about that list of immoral conduct in the last days? We we've always been told or assumed where it says in the last days men will be lovers of pleasure and and all these terrible things and evil things. Most of the body of Christ is out there expecting that at some point people are going to start to sin a lot more and and that'll be a sign that Jesus is is coming soon. And I, I came to realize Paul did not list all those sins as a sign of the last days or a sign of the second coming. He listed those things because there was a, a danger of people thinking that, well, if we've entered the days of Messiah, then shouldn't all sin end and everyone be pure and perfect and wonderful and everything at peace? But what they hadn't understood and what Paul was pointing out <clears throat> is that even though we have come to the last days, the days of Messiah, when the kingdom is at hand and available and men can be delivered from sin and go free from sin, Paul wanted to point out that nevertheless, there will be those who reject Messiah and who continue in sin. In fact, that's why right there in that very first uh, verse of, of 2 Timothy, uh, Three, it says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. That's another thing that we glom on to and say, oh, well, uh, it, it's getting close to Jesus' second coming because peril is increasing. And no, Paul isn't saying that peril is a sign of the second coming or even a sign of the last days. Notice after he says in the last days, perilous times will come, it's, there's a colon, and the very next word is for. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters. Wait a minute. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not the, the grammar expert here, but I think the word for means he's explaining his previous statement and saying this is the reason why. Yeah. He's saying in the last days, perilous times will come because not all men will accept the Savior. Some will remain in sin, and wherever people continue in, in sins of, of lust and pride and contention and striving, peril follows. Peril is the natural result of, of sin. Uh, wherever sin goes, there's, there's war and plagues and famine and all manner of peril. He's letting us know that, yes, Messiah has come, but peril will continue because 
some men will continue in sin. I'm running out of reasons to expect and anticipate evil and dark days ahead. There you go. Everything we've based that on, we're shooting down here. Yeah. And what about the great falling away? Oh, that's another popular Christian doctrine that says, oh, oh, the sure sign that Jesus is returning is that is that there's going to be what, what theology calls the great apostasy. We got to put it in theological terms and make it impressive and put the word great in front of it. Because well, that's one of the things going on here. I've come to realize the nature of the carnal flesh, carnal mind is inclined towards towards getting sort of a thrill. Well, like here at, at, at Halloween season, we get a thrill out of being scared. We get a thrill out of building things up to say, oh, it's big, it's bad, it's scary. And and we tend to even interpret scripture and prophecy in that light. Oh, it gives our flesh more of a thrill to make this sound more dreadful and 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 more damnation and judgment coming. And and the flesh just builds it up that way. And so we have a doctrine called the great apostasy. I looked it up and come to find out it's based on 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, where Paul is talking to the Thessalonians and saying that about the second coming of Jesus and saying, don't worry, it hasn't already happened. That won't happen until what he calls the falling away. Three words. Three words that he doesn't bother to explain, but later he says, when I was there with you, Thessalonians, I talked to you about these things. Well, I'm thinking, I'm sorry, but what a horrible method of theology to take three words that in and of themselves don't really explain or say anything, create a doctrine out of it when you know Paul did teach more about it to the Thessalonians, but didn't bother to record it anywhere in the Bible. And we make a whole global worldwide doctrine out of it. That's, that's, I'm sorry, that's just reckless. That's not good theology. As far as that goes, as far as that goes, we, as far as we know, it may have just been a a local prophecy that was given in the Thessalonian church about some falling away that was going to come in Thessalonica, or, or it might've been about a a falling away that was going to happen in the next generation or, or, or before the second coming or anywhere in between. In fact, I've I've considered if you want to if you want to believe for a global falling away or regression, uh what about the dark ages? That qualifies pretty well. But for some reason, <laughs> we are just determined to find something like that and ascribe it to the second coming and say doom and gloom ahead. We're all going to fall away and there's going to be great apostasy. But I, I find it interesting that all the people who say, oh, we're all going to fall away from faith in Christ, th- they're not the one that's going to fall away, though. They, they think somehow they're going to stay in faith. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> well, we're running out of reasons to expect doom and gloom like the flesh, uh, flesh seems to get a thrill out of. Oh, but what about Matthew 24 and the corresponding records in... Um, uh, Mark 13 and Luke 21, where the same account is given, the same the same um, uh, story is is given prophetically, and um, uh, people we, we just automatically know that's about just before the second coming, and yet in recent years I've heard some teaching say uh, explaining how this actually very well fits the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. And you think, oh, no, no, heresy. It, it couldn't be about what happened in 70 AD because we all know that's a future event. But then I went back and read it, and I realized all of Matthew 24 in those corresponding passages begins with Jesus walking through the temple and saying, not one stone here will be left on top of another which we know by the historic record happened when the Romans raised Jerusalem in 70 AD. And after Jesus said that, the disciples privately asked him, Lord, when will this be and what will be the signs? And then he launched into all of Matthew 24. And after him telling about the destruction of the temple that would happen in 70 AD and the disciples asking him for signs of when that would happen, we just automatically say, and that's all future tense. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on that, and I don't want you to change your theology 
just because I say so, but 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 don't base your theology on just because other people say so either. Yeah, yeah. Go study and think for yourself. Yeah, Go search the scripture. And pray and ask for the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. And like I've done in a few things like this and, and some related topics over about the last five or 10 years, I've found myself asking, Lord, could this be? How does this really work? And and you'll find little things falling into your path and pieces starting to fit together. And God might show you this weekend, or he might teach you over the next 10 years by, by bringing knowledge into your path. And you might start to get a different vision. And even, even uh, the book of the Revelation, again, I'm not telling you what to believe there. I'm not telling you I've got it all figured out. But Again, there are those who teach it's coming in the future before Jesus returns, but I've also heard some make a very studious and historically sound case for it also fits the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and that sounds absurd, but you know, as I was studying for this, I, I got to looking around and found out, you know, in the very beginning of the book of the Revelation, it says these are things which, quote, must shortly take place. And in the end of the book of Revelation, in chapter 22, it again says these are things which must shortly take place. Okay, again, I'm not going to claim to understand all the prophetic, visionary uh, things that, that, that are recorded there and have it all figured out. But on the other hand, I'm starting to think maybe the experts don't have it all figured out either, because You're, you think <laughs> too, often, too often I hear experts and, and people telling us what's going to happen at the end according to Revelation, but they're not actually quoting Revelation. They're just saying what they think. And too often I hear people talking about so-called end time prophecy and, and, and interpreting Revelation and other prophecies and things on some formula. That, well, first you see, you have to realize this symbol represents that, and that word really means this. And there's kind of like this Bible decoder ring for understanding prophecy to get it to say what we believe it says. And, and I, I realize, you know, th that, that's really the thing that conspiracy theories are made of. Um, Come on. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm not telling you what to believe about Matthew 24 or the book of the Revelation, but I am telling you to call into question everything you think you know and, and go aside. Ask God, Lord, do I know this because other people say it or do I know it because you say it? Show me what Man. your word says. Show me how to understand your word by your word, comparing your word to your word. Yes. Um, Amen. And consider these things. We also say, but aren't things actually getting worse? Well, yeah, if you believe things are getting worse and look for it hard enough, I've found if you look for anything hard enough, you will find it, whether it's... Yeah, there. yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and here in America, we point to moral decline. Well, yeah, there is some. But I, I can point to other countries where there's revival taking place. The, the underground church in China, the second... I've read recently, the second biggest church in the world is in India. There's revival happening in Iran. I, I, I've read accounts of, of missionaries going into... Muslim villages and, and with, with uh, witnessing products and, and entire villages coming to Christ. The, the Muslim imams of the village getting converted and saying, we want more of your materials because we want to teach the whole village. <laughs> I mean, there's revival taking place. And, and human history is a history from, from Old Testament Israel to, to America and our great awakenings is a history of ebb and flow of, of revival of decline and, and of awakening again. Uh, the sea of humanity ever since the fall of man and exodus from the garden has been like, like a wave that's, or a sea that's driven with waves and tossed, that, that there's, there's waves and troughs and, and it's, it's unstable. So yeah, of course there's times when we're going up and times when we're going down. But frankly, the general direction of, of humanity is upwards and towards civility. I mean, just, just ask yourselves. We, we used to commonly engage in child sacrifice and thought that was normal. Uh, uh, polygamy has ended. Slavery has ended. There's a lot of things that have changed. And if you look back and think about it, it actually all corresponds 
to the word coming. The word in the Old Testament beginning to teach us right from wrong. The word being preached in the New Testament. The, the word going out after the Reformation. The word going out from, from America with the printing of Bibles and sending of missionaries. As the word goes out, the, the entrance of the word gives light and the darkness does not yeah. overcome it. And you can track the increase of, of civility in, in humanity and on this planet according to the entrance of God's word bringing light. So I, I discount that idea too, that things are getting worse. No, I, I can find things getting better. The Praise sum God. of it all Praise is God. this, that moral and spiritual decline are not needed nor prophesied in order for the second coming of Christ. I can't find it anywhere. And, and if you think you know some other verses that say that for Jesus to return, things have to get worse, well, tell me about it. Let's go study those verses. But I think we've dispensed with, with the majority of them that such beliefs are based on. And I believe, and have come to observe, Satan has pulled a con job on the church. Uh-oh. Satan has convinced us that for Jesus to return, things have to go downhill. Satan has to increase. Darkness has to increase. People have to turn away from God, fall away, go into apostasy. Satan has convinced even some of us word of faith, spirit-filled Christians to use the word of faith principles to his advantage believing in our heart that evil is going to increase and speaking it out of our mouth. That's the word of faith message, and he's got the church using it for him when nothing wow. scripture even supports it. That's heavy. Yeah. That is. That is. It's, it's a con job. God gave man dominion stewardship over this planet, and as far as I can tell, he never took it back. Right. Man still has dominion stewardship to, right. to govern this planet. God created this planet with words and faith, and he designed it to be a word, faith, controlled, operated system. And now Jesus has given us authority to be the stewards of this planet with words and faith that he authorizes using his authority. We ought to be speaking over this planet what he speaks, not what Satan has taught us to fear and conned us into believing has to happen in order for Jesus to return. So what does Jesus say? What does God say? What does heaven say? What does the word of God say that, that we, as the, as the stewards of this planet, can hear with our ears, believe in our heart, and speak out of our mouth to decree and declare over this planet that heaven has authorized? Well, what about... Yes. Matthew 4:17 where where it says that from that time Jesus began to preach and say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand that's Jesus announcing that the last days the days of Messiah have come to you and for the first time since the fall of man the kingdom that is from heaven is now at hand for men to reach out and lay hold of Hallelujah. by faith in the savior Man, that's exciting news. Then in, in Matthew 10, 7, Jesus turns around and commissions his disciples to go out and preach the same message. Preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the church's calling and mission, not just then, but now and until Jesus returns. This is our calling to preach, publish, proclaim the fact that Messiah has come. We've entered the last great and glorious days yes. of Messiah and the kingdom of heaven is available for men to reach out and by faith in Jesus lay hold of and become citizens of that kingdom while living here on earth. Another proof, Jesus said, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and, and told us that whatever heaven binds or whatever heaven forbids or prohibits, we're authorized to prohibit on earth. Whatever Amen. heaven does authorize, we're authorized to, to release and unleash and, and authorize it here on earth. That's good. This is the church's calling and mission. The entrance of God's words give light, as I, as I pointed out earlier. You think there's darkness in the planet? Well, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of darkness. You know what the cure is? 
the preaching and teaching of the word because the entrance yes. of the word gives light and the darkness Amen. cannot overcome it. Amen. The Bible Amen. says Amen. of the increase of his government and peace, there's there will be no, no end. end. We shouldn't be confessing that, oh, things are getting dark and evil and the devil's about to take over and the Antichrist is about to kill us. No, we're authorized to speak God's word that says Jesus and his government and his kingdom have come and of the increase of that kingdom, there will be no end. This thing is going up and forward only and not backwards. Okay, like uh, like Pastor you. Loretta preached a couple of weeks ago about, about God's word that's gone forth out of his mouth will accomplish what he pleases. Um, it will prosper in what he sent it to do. And, and it will accomplish those things. It's going forwards and it will not go backwards. Mm-hmm. And that word is to be put in our mouth and spoken into the atmosphere yeah. of this earth yeah. until Amen. heaven's kingdom comes and heaven's will is done on earth as in heaven. That's what Jesus told us to be saying and praying and doing. Praise we do God. all these things through through the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, not by the blood of the lamb and waiting around to see what happens, but by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testifying about it and speaking and decreeing it into the atmosphere of this earth. You know that 2 Peter 3.12 actually says, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. That's the coming of Jesus the second time you know that we can actually hasten or quicken or accelerate that according to the word, according to the Bible, according to 2 Peter 3.12, we're looking for and hastening the coming. How do we hasten the coming? By believing what God says in our hearts and speaking it out of our mouth and decreeing and declaring into this earth the things that God says, the things that heaven has authorized for earth that we decree into the earth with our dominion stewardship and our authority in the name of Jesus speaking on his behalf, heaven's will on earth until heaven's will is done in earth. That's what the last days are about. And I'm I'm oh, sorry, I, I, I will not tolerate anymore hearing oh, about the last days being something that's coming or the last days being something that's dark and doom and gloom. I, I'm not even entertaining the term end times as though things are ending and devolving. No, I am entertaining the, the, the term last days, the days of Messiah, the days of the king and the kingdom that have come and that we declare the kingdom is at hand and and heaven's kingdom is within us and coming forth through us in power to do the works of heaven on earth until his will is done and we hasten the day of his coming. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. (laughs) Well, Bob, you have blessed us. What a great message. So appropriate for for what we're experiencing right now, there is so much doom and gloom and negativity. And I've said this before, it doesn't bother me too much what people in the world say, but it does bother me what people in the church are saying, yes. uh, because they influence so many people and uh, all those things are repeated, all that negativity. So thank you. Uh, this, this message is going to help a lot of people. It's a keeper. Praise God. Everybody unmute yourself and give the Lord a hand clap. That we're Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Pastor Larry, can I talk for a minute? Larry, can I just say something here? Yes, you know, you uh, even Pastor. though Bob was talking uh, and about, you know, correcting our theology, if you look at this message that he just, and I have to tell you, the preach was on him. I don't think he was. There it was. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my Lord, if we, if we had been in a church, it would have been like the Church of God in Christ. We would have been shaking those big uh, I, handkerchiefs. I would, have had to dance up and, I would have had to dance up and down the aisle a couple of times. Yes. Well, I want to say, uh, if you look at this, this is a message of love. Because you know what he said? Oof, like so much. But he said that the devil has tricked us. I'm just saying the royal us into saying so many things and to the extent the last days, the you know, horrible times, people getting bad, look at the world, they're horrible, to the extent that the so-called church hates the sinners because they're getting so bad. 
But you know, this message here, when we change our focus and we realize, wait a second, this is a message of love that we have to stop saying things are getting bad, but people are, when people ask for all these different things, Pastor Larry and I, we lived in California, San Francisco, people call that the new age, because it, it actually uh, import or exported new age throughout the world. You know, even though people call them and condemn them, let Pastor Larry and I saw this as people who were looking for truth. They were just looking for an answer. That's and, it. And Elder Bob said, we have the answer. But if we're saying gloom and doom, they don't, they already know that. It's like going to the dentist and opening your mouth. You go, oh, that's a cavity. Well, yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Pastor so anyway, ready made. this is a message of love for the church to look at and go, wait a second, we need to change what we're saying and say to a lost and dying world that this is the dispensation of grace, the age of grace. Thank you, Elder Bob. Thank you. Amen. And thank you, I just Pastor got stirred Loretta. up, Pastor, and I just wanted to get my two yeah, cents in. Me too. <laughs> um, I'm sure all of us uh, probably are stirred up right now. Um, you know, the devil doesn't have creative power as we do. His dominion was stolen through deception from Adam. And he still doesn't have the kind of dominion that you and I have. Elder Bob explained that very well. So what he does is he tricks people into using their dominion to advance his agenda. Yes. And I'm going to say this very bluntly, Christians who are repeating these lies are doing the work of the devil, prolonging the return of the Lord, giving Lucifer more time to work. We can hasten the return of the Lord by stop spouting off all of this demonic negativity. Amen. Amen. You know, the devil wants us to give him a license for all this uh, craziness that's in the world. But uh, Bob did a better job of explaining that. Uh, Pastor Loretta, you'll remember, I'm glad you brought up uh, San Francisco. I came home, home one day and told you about something that happened on BART, the Bay Area Rapid Transit, you know, the underground system. And I'm I'm looking at these four tourists from Texas, two couples, and they're trying to figure out how to get their ticket out of the big machine. And I walked over and, and I said, may I help you? And I started showing them how to how to get their tickets. And they said, they asked me, they said, where are you from? And I said, the same place you are. They said, well, we're from Texas. I said, I know. <laughs> they said, how do you know? I said, well, I'm from Texas. So, I, you know, we know one another. And uh, they said, well, what are you, if you're from Texas, what are you doing in San Francisco? And uh, I said, I'm a preacher. And they said, a preacher in San Francisco? Why? And I said, job security. I said, I love these sinners. As long as they're here, uh, they need me. Praise God. You know, there, there's a positive way to look at this. And that is, this is our opportunity to shine the light and to preach the gospel. Thank you, Elder Bob. Yes. Uh, this is going to help some people. And it's certainly uh, given me something to think about. And I'm going to do a little research, too, on the falling away. Um, yes. I'm going to dig into that a little bit, see if the Holy Spirit will show me something about the falling away that Paul didn't really explain. Praise God. Um, let me tell you a story. If you remember way back, um, way back during uh, the time of Jimmy Carter, there was a peace agreement that was called the Camp David Accord. It was signed by Israel and by uh, Anwar Sadat, Egypt. It Egypt. cost Anwar Sadat his life. He was assassinated over that by the anti-Zionist people. And so uh, uh, a, a very famous television uh, producer, I'm not going to call his name because Pastor Loretta tells me I shouldn't name names. Anyway, this if I named his name, you'd all know this very famous uh, a fellow who owned a television network, and he was uh, interviewing Jimmy Carter. And uh, not Jimmy Carter, I beg your pardon. Uh, he was interviewing, uh, 
Gosh, let me think for a moment. It's one of the one of the great prophetic voices in in the in the land. Hallelujah. And he said, "Well, you've been preaching for years that before Jesus could come back, there had to be a peace between Egypt and Israel." And the guy said, "Yeah." And he said, uh, "So this is a very important uh, prophetically. This is a very important." treaty that was signed? And he said, yes. And he said, well, do you see any reason why Jesus couldn't come back now that this is signed? And the guy said, no. And he said, well, could Jesus come back in 20 years? And the and the fellow he was interviewing said, well, yeah, I guess he could. And he said, do you think he could come back in 10 years? And the guy said, well, I don't see why not. I guess so. And he said, well, do you think he could come back in five years? And he said, well, I suppose he could. Well, this guy turns to the camera and said, you've heard it, folks. Jesus is coming back in five years. Your money's not going to be any good. Send it to us right now. <laughs> Ouch. Oh, I just couldn't believe how he took advantage of that, uh, you know, fear uh, to get an offering. Listen, we don't give out of fear, we give out of faith because seed produces harvest and harvest is something in our future. If we don't have a future, why should we why should we invest? But we invest because we believe that we're living in glorious days when we're going to reap glorious harvest and be gloriously blessed. We're going to prosper during famine. We're going yes. to succeed where others fail. Jesus is our fortress our refuge, and we're, our lives are hid with Christ in God. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, I used to hear the old Pentecostals in my church talk about the good old days and, and before things went bad. And I stood up one time and I said, you know, all you folks keep talking about the good old days. These are the best days I've ever had. Well, folks, there's no reason for you not to have the best days that you've ever had uh, believe the Bible and use your faith. And while you're at it, there's no fear here. There's no coercion. Make sure that you have a harvest. So plant a seed. Right now, if you have a seed to plant or if you want to uh, bless God with your tithes and offerings, then go to zchurch.life and bless the Lord with your tithes and your offerings. And I'm going to pray that you have a great big harvest that makes these last times glorious times for you. Yes. Praise the Lord. We're going to have a little video here so that you can take a moment to honor God with your tithes and offerings. And then don't go away. We're going to have communion and we're going to have special prayer and our afterglow. Thank you for your giving, and, and we bless you and pray that you have a great big harvest. And I want to say thank you to everyone who who uh, helps support Z Church through tithes and offerings. We appreciate you, and we pray for you, and it really, really helps. Thank you very much. Well, during the little video there, um, uh, we've already taken care of our tithes and offerings, so uh, uh, we muted ourselves, and Pastor Loretta came in, and she was just going over again. We both were, what a great message that was, and thank you, Elder Bob. Uh, you've raised the bar a little bit for us here, so thank you. 
And uh, we've got something great coming up. And let me talk, talk to you about preaching. Uh, sometimes we preach, sometimes we teach. Um, um, but there, there's sometimes that we just give a, uh, a word about communion, and it's just as important as our preaching and teaching. So uh, we celebrate communion here because it's one of our secrets for living the good life. And um, our resident Bible teacher, prophetic uh, teacher, uh, Christine, is going to lead us in communion. Christine, go right ahead. No pressure. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, no pressure following that. <laughs> okay. Um, this uh, week I've been reading from the book of First Corinthians and just going in depth more with some of the things that Paul was confronting them with and going, I don't remember reading this before. I don't remember seeing this before. So I think I had the brain of Bob in me this week. But anyway, so God gave me 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 22, just to point out that Paul was confronting them because they were taking communion at way out of whack. And they were making it like a potluck dinner, but everybody was coming and running to get their food and fill their face and no respect or honor of God at all. And they didn't even wait for the poor. If you didn't have any food to bring, too bad, so sad for you. And it's like, okay. And then he talked to them about the portion of what Jesus said about communion. But then he went into verse 27 and said, so whoever drinks unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood. That's not a light thing that he confronted them with. He said, let a man examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. So this is a time of introspection, not for condemnation, but for Holy Spirit conviction. And for anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing it is Christ's body eats and drinks a sentence of judgment on himself. So he's being real clear here about what he's saying. So the careless and unworthy participation is the reason that many are weak and sick and dying. So what exactly is Paul saying? What's his point? You're not walking in reverence. You're not honoring communion. You're not, it's not a time to come together and have a party in feeding your face. It's a time of coming together to honor the bread, which truly is Christ's body, that we're to honor and respect the cup because it truly is Christ's blood. So let's do what we need to do here today to have an attitude of reverence and honor of the body of Christ not a piece of bread, of the blood of Christ, not a drink in your cup. This truly is him here, and he's sitting here right with us. So let's do what we need to do. Father, I just command your spirit and power upon this people that as they take this body of Jesus Christ within themselves, they recognize and realize just how much he did for them that their body may be healed. In Jesus' name. And as they drink the cup of the blood of Jesus Christ, we realize the power of that blood, the anointing upon that blood, and every single area of our lives are transformed because of our honor and our reverence of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember him today. Amen. Very good, Christine. Um, it's We take communion... Seriously here, we rejoice, we have a good time, but it's not the kind of party they were having in Paul's day. It was really kind of a just a drunken party. Uh, we do it, as Christine said, to recognize what Jesus did for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. Hallelujah. Praise God. And when you think about what he did, uh, that's how we stay healthy. That's how we stay prosperous. That's how we stay right. 
is by recognizing what he did in his substitutionary sacrifice for you and me. And that brings up a point. If you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're missing out on a wonderful life of blessings. And we don't want you to miss heaven. Heaven's real. Eternal life is real. And you're one prayer away from having eternal life, from being saved, from having your ticket to heaven punched. <laughs> Amen. And all you have to do is believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess him as Lord with your mouth. Those two things, believe in your heart, say it with your mouth. So I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. See, church, you can pray this with me. Uh, you prayed it once and, and uh, it took, but it's okay to, to pray it again because we're just celebrating what he did for us. I want you to I want you to say this. Say, Heavenly Father, say it out loud. Heavenly Heavenly Father. Father. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Jesus. In my heart. In my heart. I know Jesus is Lord. I know, I know Jesus, Jesus is, Lord. is Lord. I can't get saved any other way. I can't, I can't get, get saved, saved any other way. And with my mouth. And with my mouth, I'm confessing that he is my Lord right now and forever. I'm confessing that he is my Lord right now and forever. If you prayed that in faith, if you were sincere, let me tell you something happened. God's word works. Now, you may or may not see everything change overnight, but you just did something that's changing your life and changing your destiny, and I want to hear about it. If you prayed this prayer for the first time, send me an email, Pastor Larry at zchurch.life, and let me know that you prayed the prayer. Pastor Loretta and I and Z Church are here to help you with your spiritual journey. I'll say this, if you're looking for a group of people, if you're not in church, you need to be in church. If you've been out of church for a while, you need to be in church. If you can't go to church, here's an online church and you have no excuses left Z Church is here for you. So join up with us and, and let's take this journey together. Now then, here's something else that's very important. And uh, that is we're going to have live prayer and handle some live prayer requests right now. And Pastor Loretta and our chief intercessor, Terry, is going, is going to take care of that right now. Ladies? Yes, thank you, Pastor. What a wonderful service we have enjoyed Praise God. Terry, do we have any prayer requests? The only one I see right now is from Barbara. Uh, please pray for me for complete freedom and deliverance. All right. Um, Terry, why don't you pray for her? Okay. Father, I thank you. We remind you that we have prayed for Barbara before, and we're still standing on what we have prayed before. Amen. So we call Barbara having complete freedom and deliverance with no toxic thoughts in the name of Jesus, that she is free and she is delivered. And we take authority over those thoughts and say, yep. leave. And Father, I pray that you will help her fill her atmosphere, fill her mind, fill her heart with your thoughts and, and praises and worship unto you. And I thank you. She is free because Jesus completed the work. Amen. Praise God. I, uh, Amen. Ladies, I have a prayer request, and I'm going to uh, uh, exercise my pastoral privilege here and do Absolutely. the praying over Pastor. this request. All right. Um, I have noticed on the Internet that a lot of preachers are saying that the hurricanes that hit the, the southeast United States were acts of God in judgment against left-wing <laughs> people or what have you. And um, th that kind of agrees with the insurance companies, who, by the way, are bailing out that it's an act of God. Well, I, I don't believe it's an act of God. I think it's uh, it's uh, Christians are asleep at the wheel. We have the dominion. We have That's authority. Right. We have creative power. And we should not be adding fuel to these hurricanes by talking about how bad they are. We should actually be speaking against them. Jesus spoke to the to the waves and the wind, and he said, peace be still, and there was a great calm. And he said, we can do the same thing. And I know we can because I have experienced it. I prayed against that that hurricane that was hitting Tampa, and I just prayed that, um, that it peter out. Well, it did die down. I know that a lot of people were praying the same prayer I was. So let's pray right now 
about the recovery and that it just be miraculous. And then we're going to add one more prayer to that, that these systems that they're predicting are going to get worse and worse in the Atlantic are actually going to calm down. And whatever whatever forces of, of heat and cold and convection are fueling these hurricanes, we're going to speak that peace over the Atlantic Ocean. Father, I thank you right now for helping with the relief that's going on in these states that were hit, and the families that were affected by the storms. They're not acts of God. It's not your judgment. It's just the weather is out of control because we haven't been praying the right kind of prayers. So we're changing that, and we're praying for supernatural miracles taking place in the lives and families of those who were affected. Build back faster and stronger and better in Jesus' name. And Father, we speak to these systems that are that are behind the propagation of these megastorms that peace come upon the Atlantic Ocean. And we don't see bigger and badder storms. We just see the normal weather that causes the the rain, the early rain and the latter rain to bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Amen and amen. Well, thank you, Pastor. Um, just before we go, sometimes another prayer request may come in. Is there any more prayer requests or does anyone have a prayer request that they haven't brought in? At this time, just let me know. Well, if not, Pastor, thank you so very much. I'm going to return it to you and uh, give. Thank you, Pastor Loretta, and thank you, ZT. You. you did a wonderful job. But we're not quite done with the service yet. Um, we're going to have a few anointed announcements, and then we're going to have our special afterglow. And we want everyone to know you're welcome to be with us in the afterglow. Get to know us. It's a time where we. We talk about whatever we want to talk about. Sometimes it's uh, the message. Sometimes it's other things. Sometimes we just have fun. But it's always good. So uh, you're welcome to be with us in the afternoon. It's a good way to spend a, another hour on a Saturday morning. Praise the Lord. There's some people who believe just like you do. All right. Thank you, Pastor. And thank you, Elder Bob, for, uh, for your message. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and share some announcements with all of you, um, uh, we encourage that you visit our website, zchurch.live, where you find replays for all of our past services and the Z Church blog. At our website, you can also access the Zoom links for our Zoe group meetings under Divine Connections tab. There you'll find links for our Zoe prayer group, Z Church Women's Outreach, Z Church, and the Z Church Spanish, Out Spanish Outreach. A Conce de Z Church. Are you looking for a place to serve the Lord? We have many opportunities available. Email us at the info at Z Church if you would like to join the Z team. Now it's time for the afterglow. And our host today is Terry. If you'd like to join us on Zoom, just go to our website at zchurch.life and click join live. We're so glad you worshiped with us today.